Good afternoon and welcome to IFG Live from in front of a virtual Institute for Government. My name is Nick Davies and I'm a Programme Director here. Thank you very much for joining us for this discussion on children's social care. Children's social care is one of the services that the Institute, in partnership with SIPFA, has assessed as part of our ongoing performance tracker project. Over the last decade, there have been big increases in spending on child protection, but severe cuts to universal services such as children's centres and youth services. Local authorities have persistently overspent on these services, but the increase in spending has not kept pace with demand. There's evidence that children's social workers were dealing with more complex cases, with a particularly sharp rise in the use of residential care in recent years. And all that is before coronavirus hit. The disruption caused by the lockdown and continuing restrictions has forced social workers to conduct visits with children remotely, uh, local authorities to take a different approach to procurement, and the government to temporarily remove some statutory protections for vulnerable children. Most critically, uh, and as highlighted by a new report today by the Children's Commissioner, the crisis is likely to have had a detrimental impact on the health and well-being of many children uh, with knock-on effects for children's services. So what level of funding is needed for children's social care? Be that in a multi-year spending review, as was planned, or a single year spending round, as now seems more likely this autumn. What is the right balance between uh, preventative early intervention uh, and crisis support? And which of the changes made in response to the coronavirus uh, crisis could be kept or extended beyond the crisis? To discuss these issues and more, I'm delighted to be joined by four fantastic speakers. First up will be Rob Whiteman, Chief Executive of SIPFA, the Chartered Institute for Public Finance and Accountancy. Uh, second will be uh, Jenny Coles, the Director of Children's Services at Hertfordshire County Council and President of the Association of Directors of Children's Services. Third will be David Simmons MP, member of the Commons Education Select Committee and former chair of the LGA Children and Young People Board. And fourth will be Cathy Evans, Chief Executive of Children England, the membership body for charities supporting children and young people in England. Each of our speakers will make opening remarks. I will then ask a few follow up questions before taking questions from the audience. If you have a question for any of our panellists, please submit them using the Q&A function uh, and you can submit them while we're speaking and I'll then try to ask as many of them as possible. Uh, for all those uh, watching along, uh, I'd also encourage you to tweet using hashtag IFG Public Services. Right, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, uh, Rob Whiteman. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all well. Uh, vitally important service area and the huge financial impacts uh, from it as well. Uh, only last month, uh, SIPFA published uh, a public finance perspectives a series of essays uh, called The Growing Challenge of Children's Welfare After COVID-19. Very grateful for Cathy Evans to have contributed to that. I've got three things to say uh, briefly before uh, looking forward to hearing the other speakers and then having a panel session. Um, number one, the direction of travel that many children's services departments have been taking in recent years uh, may well be uh, adversely impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. On the whole, uh, many departments have tried to move away from a, a process and compliance model uh, where we identify a gap and then try to assemble the right services uh, from various agencies in order to meet that uh, and to try and complement that instead with an assets model. How can the extended family, how can the community uh, support um, children and young people? How do we make uh, our local area a great place to live? How do we really uh, benefit from the fact that having lots of young people is good for our local economy? And so moving to that assets model, which ultimately is a better use of resources than perhaps the more traditional compliance and, and process model, that of course can be uh, adversely impacted by COVID-19 because local economies are adversely impacted uh, the the, the uh, extended family, the extended community are themselves going to be undergoing economic difficulty. On the whole, councils are trying to move to local is best. How do we have more in-house provision, more in-house local 
foster carers, for example, because it's better to be local and it's better to use an assets model, which is much stronger on, on prevention. Second thing I'd say is obviously the fiscal position. Councils use the shorthand of statutory services for things like children's services, which means that uh, the service user has a statutory right to a service, regardless of whether there's funding for it. Other services are, tend to be called non-statutory services, and although the council has a legal duty to provide them, the public don't have a legal duty, a, a legal right to receive them in the same way. So one would think of libraries or leisure centres as a non-statutory service, where children's services are a statutory service because people have a, a right in law to receive the service that they need. And the fiscal position is clearly going to put a huge strain on central government budgets and on council budgets. And children's services are an area of volatility. Whilst adult social care um, is in volume terms probably a bigger uh, financial pressure for many councils. Children's services can be volatile and can drive a council very quickly into financial problems. Of course, Northamptonshire is the most famous example of this. Um, the first council in 20 years to go bust. And when you look at its children's services, it had the same number of children in care, for example, as Essex County Council on half the population. In other words, it had doubled the rate uh, of children in care and that followed an, ad an adverse Ofsted. Uh, and actually, you know, councils in shorthand terms often think that an adverse Ofsted can cost 20 million in terms of putting the process in place that is then expected to become compliant with an Ofsted. That creates volatility in the budget but also it moves away from that direction that I spoke about at the beginning where councils want to move towards a community local assets model rather than just a compliance and process model where there's evidence it doesn't necessarily help outcomes even though it can it can cost a lot of money. Um, and then my final point and I'll hand back to you is to say I, I do feel very strongly, you know, the evidence that I've seen over over many years as a chief executive, as a director of finance, is that good children's services uh, operate within good councils. In other words, there's a partnership between the service itself and a strong centre, which adds value in terms of the implementation of IT, better performance metrics the leadership of pulling public services together more widely. So in remembering, in talking about how do we strengthen children's services, actually we want to strengthen councils themselves because good corporate councils will have better children's services. I hope those three points are useful. Thank you. Rob, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've temporarily lost uh, Jenny, so I'm actually going to move on to David Simmons uh, as our next speaker. So uh, David, over to you and if I could ask you to unmute yourself. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, lots of food for thought in what Rob shared with us. And um, perhaps starting maybe in reverse order um, of, of the points. Um, resilience is one of the things that's really been tested by the COVID outbreak. And the evidence that we've been taking at the Education Select Committee has highlighted that although there's quite a lot of money going into the system, the resilience of that system uh, has not been strong. And although, for example, we had evidence from chief executives and directors of children's services that um, the easements to the requirements on things like special educational needs um, were helpful in enabling them to get through that, they clearly don't represent a long term solution to a system that is under a good deal of pressure. And when we look at the estimates that come from uh, the local government association, um, supported by organisations like SIPFA, they highlight that there is a, a multi-billion pound funding gap within the children's social care sector in the United Kingdom. And the challenge that always comes back from the Department for Education and the Treasury is that there is no link between the level of spend and the level of performance. So they will always push back and say to local authorities, if you all spent at the level of the highest performing and lowest spending 
authority, um, then you would not have a funding gap. And of course, all of those on the call will recognise that that is um, an oversimplification of what is an incredibly complex system. But it is absolutely critical that the sector is able to explain to public, public and to government um, why um, this, this issue is so complex and that the funding gap is not as simple as just putting out a begging bowl and saying we need more money. A lot of it is about how that money is spent. And of course, if we look at local government services on the whole, there's been around a 60 pence in the pound reduction in the level of funding from central government in the last decade. Uh, and there's also been a fairly consistent rise in the levels of public satisfaction with those services. So from a political point of view, it's very easy for government departments to argue that this shows that there's not a problem. Now, behind that, when we come to social care more generally, uh, we have the issue of the level of public engagement and understanding. And if we look at these statistics from across the country, I think Birmingham City Council gives itself uh, as the local authority with the highest level of contact amongst its population with the social care system. And for them, it's less than one in five residents ever use any part of it at all, including adult social care and children's social care. So the challenge there is to demonstrate why politically it's important that we address that funding gap at a time when for the vast majority of the public who never use it or come into contact with it at all, there isn't or doesn't feel like there's a very strong case for why they should pay more tax to fund it better. And then I think finally, and this is on the point about how we spend the money. Uh, there's been a lot of debate in the context of COVID about the ability of schools to respond to the challenges, the costs that they are facing, and the announcement of various government programmes, catch up funding, school level grants for things like deep cleaning, um, purchasing personal protective equipment. And when we had the recent uh, estimates debate, looking at the funding for the school system as a whole, I think it's instructive to see that in England, according to the Department for Education, there is currently a, a figure of £240 million in cumulative deficits. State schools that are, are stating that they have less money than they are obligated to spend. And there's a cumulative total of £1.4 billion in surpluses held by schools, uh, of which a significant proportion, around 80 per cent, are schools where the DfE has needed to take action because of concern about excessive surpluses building up over many years. And of course, the challenge that this highlights is that there's 1.4 billion in surplus, there's 240 million in deficits, but the one cannot be used to address the other. And I think this really goes to the heart of the question about do we need not just to think about the total of funding that's in the system, but in a lot more detail about how we spend it and how we enable the bodies, mainly local authorities that bear that statutory accountability, to redirect that money so it goes to the purpose for which it's provided, as opposed to in, in too many cases now, sitting in surpluses uh, in many school bank accounts. David, brilliant. Thank you very much. OK, I'm going to hand over to our final speaker, Cathy Evans from Children England. I'm going to start by going back a bit. I want to do a bit of history because because last November was the uh, 30th anniversary of the Children Act 1989, which is not just the le legislation which underpins everything we're discussing today. Um, it was an, a really inspirationally vis visionary piece of legislation. It has been copied the world over since it was created under a Conservative government um, led by uh, Virginia Bottomley as the Secretary of State and, and widely credited to the um, ingenuity and pa passion and persistence of a civil servant called Rupert Hughes. And Children England has been, uh, has long been, we were, we uh, not only seconded experts from our organisation into the team that worked on the Children Act and its implementation, um, but philosophically, we've we've always been very committed to the principle and the architecture that that created. Um, and I think uh, particularly for some of the discussion that we're having, it's really important to remember what the intention and the provisions of that act were as a whole. Because, uh, and I, I started my career in, 19, in 1992 in children's homes when it was being rolled out and implemented. I was trained by the government to understand what it was for. And the vision of the Children Act was that in a whole area, in a whole community, the council would have a care and a concern for every family to stay together as far as possible 
and to receive whatever support needed in order to make that happen. It's like called Section 17 of the Children Act, and it absolutely allowed for that not to simply be a social work assess assessed provision of care uh, of a care plan that expressly said that you, the best way to meet your Section 17 duty to children in need of additional support in order to thrive and to all disabled children may be to have such provision in your community, such community services, social infrastructure, charities, other provision as parents can meet their own needs in order to thrive and their own child's needs uh, and that that should be the norm uh, and that it may be that in certain circumstances what you what you needed to do for a family to stay together and thrive was to give them cash, to uh, pay their rent, to prevent eviction, um, to organise babysitting, to alleviate pain. So it was not a, a social work obsessed act. It said that by any means possible and at local level, um, uh, we need to support all families to thrive in order to make sure that the child protection powers in that act, which of course are vital and are really important, and incredibly powerful. Um, the, the, the power of the state to take a child away from their family should only be used as a last resort when we have tried all other means to keep that family together with the support that would help that to happen. Um, uh, in uh, in the, uh, the, 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 uh, the 2019 review that the Select Committee for Communities Mental Health, uh, uh, for Housing Community, Communities and Local Government did on children's services, they said we have failed to fund that vision so so significantly that we're at risk of turning the Children Act into a blue light intervention, emergency only. Um, and uh, I was struck that uh, in 2015, Rupert Hughes, that architect of the Children Act, passed away. And at his memorial, Virginia Bottomley spoke, among many other things, about having had huge discussions at the time of creating the Act about whether it required a distinct and express funding system and that they had overtly dis discussed that and said look this is so this is about us integrating uh, this commitment to all children and families so deeply into a council that we have the funding mechanism it is called the revenue support grant um, and that is what our income taxes from that go into the treasury are paying for when they come back out to councils and are dispersed and distributed um, to according to need. So when we saw in 20, well, not just in 2015, but particularly in the 2015 uh, comprehensive spending review, that there was an overt intention to end the revenue support grant altogether and to uh, and, and a casting of councils using revenue support grant as a reliance on a subsidy rather than the people's contribution to the costs of meeting duties. Um, we were uh, terrified <laughs> because that conversation uh, had happened without acknowledging that the RSG was the means by which we fund the Children Act and that that, that was the original design by the Conservative government in 1989. What's changed? Because there are now already councils. So I, so I guess I'm not going to get stuck into the detail of how much I, we certainly observe and support the LGA call on the gap. But I want to I, I think we need to talk about funding architecture to deliver the legislation that Westminster passed asking councils to part, to deliver. And uh, if we uh, if we recast the redistributive grants from Whitehall to councils as some kind of top up or a bailout instead of the means by which our taxes go to support children and families, then we have uh, created a structural failure to meet the aspirations of the Children Act. Uh, that's why we have created a, a call for a Child Children Act funding formula. If anyone has been watching uh, uh, anything that we that we do in Children England, this is not a new idea. But this this sprang from saying, OK, well, with hindsight, perhaps it did. Perhaps the Children Act did need an express funding system in order to make sure that councils had the resources to deliver the legislative vision that Westminster created. So for us, uh, there should be a formula for redistributing our income taxes back out to councils uh, based on the size of the actual child population, the proportion of those children who have special needs and disabilities, and then a multiplier on deprivation. Because the single, all of the evidence shows that the single greatest correlation between demand for 
crisis social care and uh, 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 is the strongest coalition oh, with, uh, with um, declaration. I'm just um, <clears throat> we also think in the chat, is that the one you mean? Sorry, uh, Jenny, Jenny, we're hearing you as well. <laughs> um, we also think that that has to come to councils on ring fenced because uh, the vision for uh, what community should be that councils co-produce what's needed locally with the children, with the families, with the residents of a council, not with strings and budgets attached to a, a, a bureaucratic idea of what, what's necessary. And in that context, what I want to say is that I, 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 I am completely committed to early intervention. No one could get me wrong on that. Prevention is definitely better than cure. I think Section 17 was and should still be viewed as a, uh, an early intervention general duty. Um, but I think we have created a false dichotomy between the, between the costs of early intervention and the costs of what has unfortunately become termed as late intervention. Um, child protection powers are, are a need. A child who is in need of protection um, has many other needs as well, but being protected may be the act of early, early intervention to prevent worse harm. Um, these are not, we, we, we've got tangled in a false binary, um, but if we are to use care as a last resort, then we need to know that we have tried everything else possible first. And that means we have to see the disinvestment, the cuts to the community infrastructure to open access, parental referral, mutual support services that could have prevented a need to care as a, 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 as a in conflict with a commitment to keep the most powerful, uh, the, the powerful force of removing children into care as a last resort. We have to invest in every child and every family in order to know that we are only taking children into care when it's absolutely necessary. So I think we've we've created a bit of a false dichotomy and we imply that we are spending too much on children in crisis. Um, I don't know any child uh, in care who's having who's having money lavished upon them, but we absolutely have to look at how we're spending money, in particular in the in the in the incredible dominance of private sector care provision and private equity on the provision of that care. So I, I also want to just round up by saying that, uh, you know, we are also in a situation where looking at this through the lens of children's services alone is not enough um, because uh, if we, we we have rising child poverty, we have a housing crisis, um, we have rising food poverty, reliance on food banks, um, and whether in work or on benefits, insufficiency of in income. And all of those, are they go to the core of the, our universal human needs as human beings. These are not, they, these are not things that, that a childhood should be without. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs has taught us that for a very long time. So if we, 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 can, we can, there are many important things that happen under the banner of early help and trying to prevent care. But can we imagine what would happen to the demand for social care if every child had a safe, secure, decent home, did not have uh, suffer food poverty, that their parents had secure incomes that were enough to keep going on? Um, that, that would be a far more radical alteration of the demands that are, that are arising on councils and children's services at the moment. Um, but I don't ever want to call a decent home and enough to live on early intervention. Thank you, Cathy. Jenny, I, th I think we have got you back, uh, which I'm delighted uh, to see. And um, before I hand over to you, um, just a reminder to those watching uh, that you can submit questions via the live Q&A and I'll try to get through as many of those questions as possible. Right, um, over to you, Jenny. OK, thank you very much and apologies for, for the delay in joining. So I'd just like to say a few things. Um, and start by saying funding for children and families and that investment in children, young people and families for them to be able to thrive and not just survive, especially in the wake of the pandemic and at the moment is so, so important. We need to, as we know, level up children's life chances. Indeed, four million children are below the poverty line, DWP 2020 from their research. So the cost, as Cathy was saying, of late intervention is estimated by the Early Intervention Foundation at £17 billion each year. 
And so what the Association of Directors of Children's Services are saying is that we need sustainable funding, that we need to look at this, not over just one year, despite the announcements and one can understand in the current crisis that we're in, why the government has made that. But we've been in one year funding and time limited projects for so many years now. And children's funding comes across from across a range of government, de government de departments. And this needs to be more coordinated if it's going to get to the right place and improve life chances. So the Association of Directors has particularly highlighted in our publication last week, four areas that we feel are priorities for investment for children's future. And as other speakers I know have been speaking about, prevention is at the heart of that. And I'll say a few things about that in a minute. Care in its widest sense. So absolutely children in care, but also those services that are still vital in preventing children coming into care, but might be at a higher level of specialist need, like child protection and children in need. Special educational needs and disability is sorely underfunded and the legislation principles of 2014 are absolutely the right ones, but we need to be properly funded to enable those to happen. And then a first class education, which wraps around all of this. So on prevention, as I've said, an end to those time limited pots of money. And at the core of this is the Troubled Families Programme, which has ample evidence from the government's evaluation done by MHCLG very recently. This is a programme which underpins so many, so much of the preventative work that's happening in local government after so many years of reduced funding. It's the area where in early intervention, local authorities have had to make savings. And just to give an example of areas where those short-term funded pots, in terms of domestic abuse, which comes again funding from a variety of government departments so so needed to support such a key area in preventative services and prepare the ground for what we hope will be the domestic abuse bill moving to enactment later this year or certainly early next year. Early intervention is also so important in terms of early years and children's centres, yet this is the area that we've had to reduce over the number of years despite some really innovative solutions across the country, working particularly with our public health colleagues and public nursing. This is an area that has sustained year on year reductions in funding. But also youth work, and now youth work is really coming to the fore in terms of what it can absolutely address. We've heard a lot about how it can address in terms of youth violence and exploitation, but there's also some really innovative work that's going on linking with health services around emotional health and well-being. So, so important to support young people in the impact of what's been happening in the pandemic. Care in its broadest sense is not just about children in care. It's also about child protection and children in need. And we have seen through the innovation program some really good models of practice that have been properly evaluated and are making an impact. And that is underpins the DFE Strengthening Families Programme. But we need to see access to those models from far greater number of authorities and local areas than is currently happening. In terms of the care system, good quality care close to home is absolutely integral to the work to support children and young people. And again, we have seen innovation projects that show projects and models that work around Mockingbird and No Wrong Door. And yet this is only seen in certain parts of the country because of that funding. Placement sufficiency for children in care was already a bigger challenge before the pandemic. And we see that increasing. Residential, both residential care and foster care we need to really rethink how we are looking after our children and the fact that so much of the provision is in the hands of so few companies and increasingly the case of the fragility of that market. And we've seen local authorities now beginning to go particularly back into the area 
of residential care to try and find solutions where children were not taken out of their communities. I'd also want to mention for children in care, mental health, emotional health and well-being, so, so important because the children that are in our care now have extremely complex needs because of the success of some of those preventative programmes I've been talking about. And that investment has been really welcome from the Department of Health and Social Care over the last couple of years, but that's needed and must continue. We know from young people's views during the pandemic, their biggest concern is around emotional health and well-being. And in terms of special educational needs and disability, properly funded services for the Act and looking at what works well across the country, we really need to continue to look at that and welcome the SEND Care Review, which I understand now is definitely going to report next year. So a really important area and one where we must co-produce with families and young people. So there's some thoughts to engender our discussion today. Thank you very much. Danny, thank you very much. Right, I'm just going to ask a um, few questions of the panellists first. We've had some questions coming from the audience, so do keep those coming in and I will uh, move on to those. Uh, panellists, I'm going to direct questions to you one at a time. If I haven't come to you, but you'd like me to come to you on, on a question afterwards, please do raise your hand and I will come to you afterwards. Um, Jenny, while I've got you on, um, when we organised this event, uh, we were sort of in the in the lull after the, the first wave. Clearly, in the last few weeks, cases have started to rise again. There have been there have been local lockdowns for a while. There have been more substantive local lockdowns and national lockdowns again. And it looks like a, there may be a, a second wave and further lockdowns to come over the winter period. How well prepared do you think children's social care services are now compared to where they were, say, at the beginning of March? I think um, children's social, well, children's social care, care so, social services broadly beyond um, just social care services have really risen to the challenge. That doesn't mean to say there haven't been pressures, but in terms of rolling out technology, looking at creative ways of engaging with families on a virtual basis, um, also face to face, but, but using um, other settings than in the home, um, and regular coordination with partnerships through local safeguarding partnerships has really brought a whole range of services and support to families. But of course, we can only deal with what we know. And in terms of eyes and ears on the ground, schools are really, really important in that. And that's absolutely key to keeping schools open um, safely and managing um, the second wave of pandem pandemic and so forth. But I think, there's a, so to conclude, I'd say there's a number of things. One is that children's social care services have embraced a range of ways of working um, and supporting families. That the partnership with police and with schools when they've been open, with health services, now health services, particularly health visitors and school nurses are back to their substantive posts and partnership with the voluntary sector has enabled services to carry on. What we are concerned about is um, families who perhaps wouldn't have needed support in the past, but because of various challenges with the pandemic, maybe financial challenges, if families now um, have, have lost wage earners in the household, but that will create increased need. And although the focus has been on adult health and care, quite rightly, in the early months of the pandemic, the impact on children and families, we believe, will show over the next three to four months. Thank you. Cathy, I wanted to come to you on that partnerships point, because I think that's one of the things that we've heard quite a lot, that during the crisis, there's been kind of more collaboration uh, in kind of different ways between statutory and voluntary sector than kind of traditionally there, there may have been. From your membership, it, does that chime with the experience? And if so, how do you think we can get that to continue beyond the crisis? Yes, I mean, so, f firstly, I would say as 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 the lockdown was was descending in March, uh, and the, the extent of how it would impact on um, on all organisations, but for us and our members on charities, um, 
there was a lot of anxiety that actually some of the uh, I mean uh, in children in the children's charity sector we are far more likely than any other kind of charity to have a funding relationship with a council um, and that's because of the Children Act that's because the Children Act creates an overarching duty to all children whether we're funded by the council or not a children's charity in a community is working under the auspices of Children Act needs to collaborate with the council and many of our members are providing foster care, residential care, so uh, some of them are 100% or near enough 100% funded to work with councils uh, to deliver statutory duty. So, so what hurts councils hurts our members. Uh, we learned that over many, many years in terms of uh, how austerity has hit councils and that has passed on to charities as well. Um, and we were very worried that some of the issues that we've long been concerned about in, in terms of how public procurement is done, uh, but the market mechanisms by which it's done, the very tightly specified contracts, um, a tendency to over over obsess about KPIs and to nail everything down in a very contractual way, that all of those things, as well as funding challenges, would place really serious risk uh, but for the organisations that are currently su uh, to supporting councils to meet their statutory duties, whether that's adoption, fostering, residential care, family support. Um, so, so there was a lot of anxiety that contracting uh, and its methods and its mechanisms would exacerbate the risk that the, the pandemic presented. Um, a few things happened so that we were delighted about the, the Cabinet Office ex uh, putting out a policy procurement note uh, in March, which really under, uh, underlined what we have believed for a long time should be the new norm uh, in terms of saying, uh, you know, if you if you are have been working with and contracting with charities, then this is a relationship. You need to actually work out what gets you both through this. And so on a relationship basis, do what you need to do. You may need to pay some ca some some advance payments instead of doing it all by arrears. You may need to vary from KPIs. You may need to vary the purpose of the contract to do to meet a need that wasn't present until this pandemic. All of that flexibility, um, my my my, you know, uh, my it's not universal. There are definitely um, bad experiences during the pandemic of commissioning, just as there have been um, before. But I'm quite struck by the volume of my members who have said working with the council during the pandemic has broken down and improved a lot of those previous ways of doing that. It's much more creative, much more collaborative. There is a sense of partnership and we hope it will last. So we are, we, we've certainly said to the Cabinet Office, can you please extend that policy, that procurement policy note philosophy? It, 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 it isn't just for an emergency. Um, it works better for both public, public officials and for providers to be flexible, to be um, mutually intuitive, to be reporting to each other about what's changing, to think about cash flow, to think about um, being creative about purpose as well as about delivery. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I just uh, want to say though, there's a world of other that we need to talk about in relation to the care placement market, because that is that that is different. And it's got some serious structural problems that we can't just change in local practice. Rob, I was going to come on to you um, anyway um, to kind of ask about kind of different approaches to procurement, but I actually wanted to bring in a, a couple of questions um, that we've had um, from the audience that are associated with this topic. So uh, Anthony uh, Tamburo has asked, uh, do we not need to move to a model where provision of services should default to the local authority uh, and not to the private sector? And furthermore, should there be more cooperation between local authorities so that best practice service and specialism can be more easily and effectively implemented? Uh, and similarly, there's another question uh, from uh, someone anonymous asking, is it sensible for councils to get back into delivering services in-house? So Rob, I'd, I'd welcome your thoughts on those issues. I think very often this has been driven by the financial position that David Simmons mentioned uh, in his introduction that councils have lost 60% of resources, by far uh, the, the biggest cuts that have been meted out to any, any part of the public sector. And I think that has driven procurement activity in order to save as much money as possible rather than get the right balance between spend and quality and outcome and I think privately uh, 
a lot of people are doing what they can to maintain quality and outcome, but privately they would acknowledge that it's very tough balancing the books and that they've been driven to procurement specifications and procurement activity that in an ideal world uh, they would they would seek to avoid. Local is best, whether that's delivered in-house or whether that's using local providers. I think these are best decisions made by local commissioners based on their based on their local need and also the creation of the market that they commission. I think looking forward, the difficult thing at the moment is how is this going to get funded before the COVID-19 crisis? The government was thinking of letting councils keep all of its business rates. Traditionally, the government has kept 50 percent of the of business rates and sort of bagged it into the national exchequer. And in the old days, of course, as as Cathy mentioned, it used to give that back to councils through revenue support grant. But when revenue support grant was cut and in effect, government kept the business rates without giving any back uh, in order to ensure that need could be met, uh, we hit a crisis. And the government had got to a position where before the crisis, it was going to allow councils to keep more of their business rates and have a fair funding formula in order to fund need. Um, business rates are probably not a very good basis for the for funding local services over the next decade because of the economic crisis. The business rate base has taken a real hit. So I think there's a huge amount of uncertainty at the moment about how will councils be funding. They, the, the income hit that they've taken, uh, as well as the, the difficulties of business rates, mean that it, I can't see a sustainable model at the moment for funding local authorities, and we're going to have to raise that in CSR. And my final point on that would be, isn't that different to where we want to get? You know, at the moment, we're looking at countries like Germany, where local authorities don't have to ask for permission to carry out a function. They don't have to ask government for money to carry out a function because they have access to a broader set of taxes. They can have some of some income tax, some uh, sales taxes, some corporation tax, and therefore they invented test and trace and have made a marvellous job of it because they needed neither permission nor funding from government to do so. I really think that's the vision of what we want in for devolution in England, where everything is devolved except those things that the government reserves to carry out itself. And I think we're getting to breaking point. And I, I fear that some of the, you know, quite tight budgets and tight procurement rounds that councillors have gone through at the moment could get worse rather than better unless we get a decent comprehensive spending review. Thank you, Rob. And you've rather helpfully and cleverly answered another question that we received oh, from Simon Judge, who said, I uh, my best. Um, don't many of the points uh, related to children's social care funding actually apply to the funding for, lo for local authorities more generally? And I think you're absolutely right on that. David, I'm, I'm going to come um, to you, as, as Rob just said, and as we um, Oh, we all know the government faces some very difficult financial questions uh, going forward and whether that's in a, a spending review or just a single year spending round there are a lot of competing priorities a lot of unknowns uh, how do you think where do you think kind of children's social care is in the minds of kind of decision makers within government and uh, kind of related to that there was a, a question from someone asking kind of any tips on how to make the case to conservative MPs and those in government for children's social care? In short the question about where is it in the minds of decision makers in government I think most of the time it isn't and that's been a, a long-standing issue I don't think the local government on the whole is in the minds of of many people in government and it was always said that the one government department whose back phone was never answered at Downing Street was the MHCLG. <laughs> Anybody else who phoned them up and said we've got a major crisis um, somebody would be on the case straight away but there was always a sense that most of that was things that were managed at arm's length and therefore it wasn't seen as a crisis. So the, the question then becomes how do we make it easy for government to do the right thing about something which politically should most of the time be relatively uncontroversial. I think the remarks that we've heard from everybody 
um, so far have illustrated that the complexity of the system is one of the major challenges. And I think picking up Rob's point about the loss of the revenue support grant, I know Cathy touched on this as well. Um, government's expectation, uh, and it's reflected in the discussion about using spending power rather than RSG as a means of calculating the financial position of local government, is that over that period of time, there has been a significant rise in business rates income that's gone into local authorities. So the, the level of funding, the resource base, has not shrunk by the same amount by which the level of government grant has shrunk. And of course, children's social care and early intervention are the two areas of local government spending that have risen in the last decade, partly as a result of that, that use of that additional resource that has come through the system, but also at the expense of other things like environmental services, planning and adult social care, where we've seen not just a reduction in line with RSG, but an even deeper reduction because local authorities have prioritised the spend uh, on, on children, on vulnerable children. So how do we make it much more straightforward? Well, the care review certainly is, is one area where I think that, that opens the door to that discussion. But I think the, the key thing for me, and, and I think this is especially important in the post-COVID era, is the argument that this is, um, it's an efficient way to use public money. And the money that we spend on children in the earliest years of their lives makes a colossal difference to what their future is like and it has the ability to transfer transform people's lives from being um, potentially a, a life of dependency uh, a life that may not be really what that person would aspire to to being a life that is is seen as being a, a good positive one that somebody can enjoy and where they can contribute and i think that's the thing that's that's crucial because demonstrating that the money that we spend here really is an investment on part of society because of the transformational difference it makes, not just to that individual, but to everybody else around them in their family and their community. That's where I think the case needs to be made. So the care review is a significant part of that. And building on the research which the department's been doing through the What Work Centres to demonstrate that we are not spending this money in this regard because we are compassionate, but we are spending it because we are efficient in a way that we want to deliver public services is critical to winning that argument. Thank you. I think it's a really good point about the kind of the importance of taking an investment framework to this. As as Rob noted earlier, you know, certain types of support are much more expensive than some other types of support. And Jenny, I wanted to um, ask you a, a question from the uh, audience of um, why do we see a, a care hierarchy with children placed in less expensive provision as a first placement? Shouldn't we be ensuring children receive the right intervention, even if this is specialist residential care, when they first enter so that this investment is more cost effective over the long term? Absolutely. And picking up on what David's just said and what I said earlier, you know, there are models around that, um, that, the, that the DfE have funded in terms of innovation that work. We know that from um, No Wrong Door, for example. Um, but the problem is, is that we've been in a situation now for probably at least a couple of years where it's not a question of finding the right placement. It's about finding a placement. And we need to really look at um, not, I mean, it should be a, our home system, not our placement system for children in care. Um, and it shouldn't be seen as a market because what we're about, whether or not it's a local authority provision or a private or voluntary sector provision, it's providing the right home for the right for children at the right time. And over the last couple of years, we've seen the complexity of children's needs, but also generally the age profile as well change. And what we need is a home system which responds to that and not just responds to what's available in the market. Thank you. Um, talking about different providers, um, Rob, I might come to you on this one. We've got a question from uh, Jonathan Bland, who's asked, um, does the panel think that social enterprise can play a bigger role? Uh, there are some really powerful examples of innovation that provide a very different model to venture capital driven businesses. Yeah, I, I, I do think that uh, social enterprise can play a really important role. And it links to the point that I made earlier about um, trying to make a uh, plural provision, different forms of provision that best may meet no local need 
helping local local organizations to get going and to grow it is really what commissioning is about. Commissioning shouldn't be a sort of procurement transactional exercise. Commissioning is about looking at local need, looking at the local population, looking at trends, and then how do we help organizations to grow that can that can meet that need in and and it just not being a, a, a sort of time limited transactional procurement exercise. And in that framework, I, I, I really believe in social enterprise as as part of the solution because it, it, it it's part of that sort of innovative um, user focused um, type of activity where users can can have a you know huge amount of involvement as well as um, as the organization itself. So you know I like to think that over time we can move towards smarter procurement and commissioning that can encourage organizations such as social enterprise to be an even more important part of of service provision. Kathy, we've got a, a question here picking up on um, your point about kind of uh, placement. So they've said we uh, presently have in the region of 50 different frameworks for foster care and children's homes. Uh, it's fragmenting further and driving up costs. Uh, duplication of bureaucracy is painful. Uh, do you think that we need support from central government to establish national care placement frameworks that can be uh, accessed and used flexibly on a local level? Um, well, I, I I agree with the description, and unfortunately, it's been a an, that would have been an accurate description for some time of the state of the marketplace uh, for care placements, um, and it's been a long-standing concern of ours. I I uh, my ideas of how you can reform this do involve national oversight, but I would not call it a, a you know a national framework. Definitely not. That's the, the, the bottom line here is that uh, care is not a product. It's a verb. It's a thing that people do in places, either in their own home or in a in a place that we've des designated as a, a home for the children. Um, so so commissioning. Absolutely. We need really world class commissioning of how to meet need, how best to meet need and to cater for need. Um, it can't be done by shopping. And that's what procurement is. And, uh, and so uh, we have been going out and the frameworks are a shopping framework. So, uh, you know, so are uh, spot purchases, which is, uh, I mean, uh, somewhere in the region of 70 percent of placements are being made on spot purchases in or out of framework. So so we I was part of the market market um, uh, analysis for residential care that was done by DFE or done for DFE in 2015. We found organisations with who were trying, having to keep up with having 75 or more different framework arrangements because they were national specialists. And in order to get work locally, they were having to take part in meaningless framework exercises where in fact, if a child needed them, they would get there. Uh, um, and that, that was because they were a known specialist. The bureaucracy that we are tying up in the idea of creating procurement solutions when procurement is the problem is, is, is absolutely scandalous but the uh, if we're doing the wrong thing then doing it better makes you wronger not writer calling this a market and thinking about new providers uh, bar barriers to entry making it more competitive driving people down on price these are all the wrong answers because they are answers to a procurement problem and this is not going to be solved by procurement so um i know that might sound a bit a bit big as a confrontation, but you know, if if councils had vastly more uh, capacity to invest for the long term in their own provision, in reshaping a local local capacity to know that you can confidently meet the vast majority of children's needs within the boundaries of your authority with the provision that you have set up, invested in, and trained the people for, uh, then that's a that's pretty much a twenty year investment proposition. It does take 20 years to raise a child, and I think we need that long a view on how we turn this around. But instead, we're shopping for care per bed, per night. It's the most expensive way to buy anything, but it definitely won't look at or solve our long term issues about sustainable, reliable, non profiteering care and what kind of care we need, where we need it in the country. So I do think we need national overview, but not national procurement. 
we need a national strategy and I think it should be 20 years. But it, it, but local authorities will always remain absolutely pivotal in what happens and what should happen to any child in care. Thank you, Cathy. Uh, I think we've all got time for one final question. David, I'm going to come to you uh, on the final word because I think it's directed uh, to you. So this is from Mark who said it was mentioned mm. that the government review of SEND will not now report until 2020. One, but what's happened to the review of the child care system in the most recent Conservative manifesto? And will that uh, in any way influence funding uh, in upcoming spending review? I've raised that question to the Education Subcommittee. I know with COVID, uh, pretty much all of the capacity at the Department for Education has been understandably, and I think justifiably, directed towards the, the recovery. But the key thing I, I'm keen to see that we do is that we are we're thinking about this as we go particularly into the comprehensive spending review because that will set the trends for the next few years and i think the point kathy just made you know, it takes 20 years to raise a child you know i'm lucky in that i'm a father of two very young children and i can already see the changes that have happened you know my son started school um, just over a week ago um through the way in which um investment and policy around early years um sets the tone for how a child then goes on to do in their primary and then their secondary education and I think too much of the time, what we've seen is a, a combination of policy that's often been driven by a kind of philanthropic capitalism. So people come in saying that they want to sponsor academies because, for example, they have a particular vision, rather than because we have a genuine policy based understanding about the positive difference that, that will make for children's lives. And it's part of my mission really is to make sure that we are collectively thinking a, a lot more seriously about the long term challenges. And if we think back to where we were just after the general election in December, there was a lot of discussion about how this was a government settling down with a big majority and an expectation of being here for the medium term. And um, COVID has rather taken that off the agenda in the way that Brexit did before that. But behind the scenes, we need to be thinking not just how do we recover from COVID, but how do we use the opportunity that we have for laying some serious foundations in the way that Cathy described the Children Act having done um, in the late 1980s. I spent my, my week of work experience as a teenager in a local authority legal department when the Children Act first came into force. And I, since then, it's had many amendments, but it still is the fundamental thing that underlies most of our children's social care system. But conversely, most members of Parliament are quite surprised to discover that there is very little research basis for most of the things that we do in children's social care. And that's why I think the approach that we're seeing reflected through the What Works centres is going to be a really important next stage in thinking. How do we develop what is is widely respected and is a good foundation in that act and in its amendments into something that then transforms that into something much more positive for the future of so many of those children who depend upon it. David, thank you. And with that, I'm going to bring the discussion to a close. So this event will be available to watch or listen to on our website shortly, uh, and it will also be available as a podcast you can listen to while walking the dog. Uh, for those who are interested in more. Uh, we published a report in partnership with SIPFA uh, last month on how prepared and resilient public services, uh, including children's social care, were ahead of the crisis. And we will have a, another report out in around a month's time on how public services have been disrupted by the crisis and how they've changed in response. So do keep an eye out for that. Uh, I'd like to thank our four speakers uh, for their brilliant contributions. Uh, thanks to SIPFA for partnering with us on this event uh, and thank you to all those who've watched today. Goodbye. Good.